The basic understanding of the human heart has changed little in over 300 years. Now, new insights into the structure and function of the heart will change forever the way we view it. The current understanding of the heart and its very crucial role and function has evolved over many, many centuries. The reason that we have focused so much on it is the fact that failure of this pump creates major problems in health to patients and in, in the whole health care problem and the finances and the unfortunate mortality of, of heart failure. In the third century BC, Greek physician Erasistratus described the heart as a pump that actively sucks blood in during the filling phase, known as diastole, and then contracts and forces blood out to the tissues during the ejection phase, known as systole. This active sucking pumping function of the heart was further described by Galen of Pergamon, the famous Roman physician for the gladiators. Through his observations of open chest wounds of gladiators, as well as from dissections of live animals, Galen provided vivid accounts of an active sucking diastole. Though Erasistratus and Galen had very rudimentary understandings of how the heart, vessels, and lungs work together, their concept of a heart that both pumps and sucks prevailed until the 17th century when English physician William Harvey discovered the circulatory system. When Harvey came along in 1628, he, for the first time, really led people to understand very clearly that this was a pump introduced in a circuit that was one continuous uh, circulatory system, and therefore the lung played a crucial role in oxygenating, but it was all part of one circuit. His prestige as the father of the circulation, unfortunately, transcended into his description of the heart, which was rather incomplete. And he thought this was a homogeneous muscle that, that uh, contracted and pumped and relaxed and just passively uh, was filled. And that concept uh, remained for many years. In fact, Harvey's concept of the heart prevails to this day. That is, a muscle with four chambers that contracts to eject blood and then relaxes to be passively filled by the atria. However, not everyone believed this to be true. Early in my career, I realized that uh, something was wrong in the uh, classical conception of the, of the function of the heart. Uh, I, I realized that, uh, that besides the systolic action, ejection of blood, there should exist a diastolic action of the heart to shock blood. In the early 1950s, as a fourth-year medical student at Salamanca University in Spain, Francisco Torrent Guas began an anatomical study of the heart to prove scientifically that his theory and the early observations of Erasistratus, Galen, and others were indeed correct. I start making dissections of any animals I uh, uh, put arrive to my hands, from uh, uh, sharks, from the fishes, from uh, snakes, uh, and, uh, and uh, frogs, uh, lizards, uh, and pigs, uh, sheep, uh, cows, any kind of, of hearts, and of course human hearts also in the Department of Anatomy. And uh, I started making dissections, and I was during 25 years making dissections. And I, I remember that all these uh, anatomical facts I, I saw, uh, they were like a puzzle. In 1864, Pettigrew, a well-known British professor of anatomy, described the spatial organization of the heart fibers as, quote, an arrangement so unusual and perplexing that it has long been considered as forming a kind of Gordian knot in anatomy. Of the complexity of the arrangement, I need not speak further than to say that Vesalius, Albinus, Haller, and de Blainville all confess their inability to unravel it, unquote. After 25 years of dissections, Francisco Torrent Guasp finally unraveled the Gordian knot. Yeah, from my dissections, uh, I arrived to the conclusion uh, 
that the uh, ventricular myocardium was represented by a muscular band that, uh, that uh, was running from the root of the pulmonary artery to the root of the aorta, uh, describing a helicoid in this space. And uh, you see that uh, in this helicoid uh, is, is def delimited a right ventricular cavity and the left ventricular cavity. And that, that is really uh, my contribution to the, to the knowledge of the um, macroscopic structure of the heart. What you are about to see is the dissection of the myocardial ventricular band performed by Francisco Torrent Guasp. Here, a cow heart will be dissected. All mammals and birds were found to have a similar heart structure. The heart is first boiled in water to soften the connective tissue. The atria, aorta, pulmonary and coronary arteries, as well as some fat, are then removed. The first anatomical fact to observe in the dissection of the myocardial band is represented by the anterior interventricular sulcus. This sulcus is crossed by aberrant fibers coming from the anterior aspect of the left ventricle to the free wall of the right ventricle, which, in effect, hold both ventricles together. Using only his fingers to bluntly dissect the heart, just following the natural directions of the fiber, Torrent Quas begins by cutting through the aberrant fibers along the sulcus and separating the pulmonary artery from the aorta. In this manner, the free wall of the right ventricle can be opened, revealing the right ventricular cavity. A second anatomical fact to observe is represented by the posterior limit of the right ventricular cavity, where the free wall and septum meet. Here begins a cleavage plane that must be followed all the way to the root of the aorta. At this point, you can see, once again following the direction of the fibers, how they descend into the well of the left ventricle. Next, Torrent Quasp cuts the left fibrous trigon and follows the descending fibers, separating them from the more superficial ones. Turning the heart around and looking at the septum, a third anatomical fact can now be observed. Here you can see two layers of fibers. One runs up almost vertically to the aorta, while these fibers cross almost horizontally. A cleavage plane is in this way defined between the two layers. Torrent Guasp continues the dissection, following the cleavage plane, separating the two layers. Then, by cutting the right trigon, he is able to free the aorta and unravel the myocardial band. The ventricular myocardial band, running from the root of the pulmonary artery to the root of the aorta. A singular muscular band that twists and loops like a rope into a helical structure, forming the left and right cavities of the ventricles. You know, I learned about the ventricular band when I visited Barcelona about a year and a half ago, and I went over to talk to some colleagues about a new operation we we're doing for heart failure, and they suggested that there was something in Barcelona that had dissected the heart out and had some ideas about cardiac anatomy, and I had never heard of uh, Dr. Francisco Torrent Guasp. And he and I met, and the first thing he told me is that my concept of how the heart was formed was not accurate. And then he told me that the heart's way it's, the way it has its conduction that I understood is probably not accurate. In fact, the heart's a rope. And I think that I heard something like that, and I said, that's really amazing. I, I can't believe it. But uh, he then showed us exactly how the heart was formed and, and had reduced it in its simplest possible category. And I said, that's truly amazing, because he had dissected segments of the heart, and he showed us that his concept of a rope was, was very appropriate. The ventricular band, as described by Torrent Guasp, is divided into two loops by a fold at its center the basal or outer loop, and the apical loop, which forms the apex of the heart. The right segment of the basal loop, which runs from the pulmonary artery to the posterior interventricular sulcus, constitutes the free wall of the right ventricle. The left segment of the basal loop, which ends near the aorta, 
belongs to the left free wall. At this point, the band folds down into the well of the left ventricle. This marks the beginning of the apical loop, which consists of a descendant segment and an ascendant segment, separated by the anterior papillary muscle. The septum of the heart is formed by the crossing of the descendant and ascendant segments, which we observed in the dissection. The two apical segments loop in a helical fashion, forming the apex of the heart, which reveals itself to belong to the left ventricle. When I looked at the heart the first time, I saw a circumferential basal loop, and then I saw a descending limb and an ascending limb. And they curled around each other, had a helix, and had a vortex at the tip of the ventricle. And the angles at which they go was about 60 degrees, 60 degrees going down and 60 degrees going up, and they cross each other in that way. And for years, people had wondered why that happened in the septum, why the heart looked that way. And I realized this was really a, a spiral, and I began to think about spirals, and I began to understand that uh, the spirals are almost the, uh, the master plan of nature in terms of structure and in terms of rhythm. And if you begin to look at spirals, if you look at a spiral simply and pick the middle of the spiral up, you'd form a helix. And of course, the heart is a helix. Using a unique imaging technique to examine the architecture of the heart, a cow heart is first inflated with compressed air. Then, in a series of X-ray images looking down on the heart, the helical structure of the muscular band is clearly revealed as we move down into the apex of the left ventricle. Once again, notice how the loops of the band turn in opposition. Two reciprocal spirals merging at the apex. The spiraling helical structure of the ventricular band is a pattern found throughout nature. You can see it in the patterns of seashells, in the growing flower buds of a daisy. A ram's horn gets its strength from the spirals within spirals of its architecture. The spiral is a common formation at every scale of nature, from the DNA molecule to global weather systems, all the way up to the stars. You see this correlation between a spiral formation in nature, which is common in plants, shells, fish, heaven, all different areas, and the heart seems to be one part of that spiral. And so the design of the ventricle seems to be a natural design. That is, it's no different than many of the other spirals in nature. It's just that we just discovered it. With the discovery of the ventricular band, Torrent Guasp had only solved one piece of the puzzle. How the band worked came next. When I arrived to evidence the uh, macroscopic structure of the ventricular myocardium, the, uh, I start the problem at once that to understand, to try to understand how the heart, by means of this uh, structure, of this helical structure of the, of the ventricular myocardium, how the heart could be able to develop mm, to perform uh, its two actions. I mean, the, the systolic action, ejection of blood, and the diastolic action, suction of blood. In a phylogenic study of the heart, Torrent Guasp theorized that the heart began as a worm over one billion years ago. A worm has no pump or vessels. It is the peristaltic movement of the muscles that moves fluids throughout the organism. About 400 million years ago, the worm heart became a fish heart and developed a pumping chamber. Then 200 million years ago, the fish heart evolved into an amphibian heart with a hole between the ventricles and atria. And about 100,000 years ago, the holes closed to form an ape heart, the human heart. Amazingly, a look at the human heart during fetal development reveals the heart starts and looks like a worm at about 20 days of life. At 30 days, it looks like a fish, an amphibian heart at 40 days, and then a human heart at 50 days. In effect, the heart of a human embryo undergoes one billion years of development in the course of 50 days. Torrent Quasp believed that the evolved helical human heart still essentially behaved like a worm 
in that the wave of contraction starts just beneath the pulmonary artery and follows the band to its end, where the muscle touches the aorta, much like the sequential movement of a worm. Still, Torrent Guasp had yet to determine how this worm-like band functioned in order to perform the heart's two critical activities. During 23 years, I have been, I was thinking about this problem. I, I made a lot of hypotheses, but uh, no one was convincing me until it arrived one moment, one moment in which I was, I was invited to give a talk in a hospital in Madrid. And uh, I remember that after the, the, the giving the talk, uh, somebody put a, f a videotape in a TV monitor and they saw the heart, normal human heart, working. And when I saw this, this image, then uh, uh, the light came to my brain, and then I realized what was the mechanical trick used by the heart. What Torrent Guasp observed was the base of the heart moving down and the walls thickening during ejection, and then the base moving up forcefully, increasing the volume of the heart during diastole. All the while, the apex stays in place, virtually motionless. The apical loop, the, the fibers are vertical, like my fingers. And uh, the basal loop, the, the fibers are horizontal, like my other fingers. And uh, I, realized, I realized that the movement of the heart, made by the heart are the following ones. The base is going up and is coming down. On the, on the apical loop, which remains motionless. Like a piston and cylinder, it is the forceful decrease in volume that pushes the blood out, and it's the forceful increase in volume that creates a potential vacuum, which sucks in the blood. Only in the heart, it is the cylinder or basal loop that moves up and down, while the piston twists to move the cylinder. The mechanical trick referred to by Torrent Guasp occurs in the contraction of the apical loop. When the wave of contraction reaches the descendant segment, the muscle shortens and pulls the basal loop, the cylinder, down towards the apex. When the contraction continues on the relaxed descendant segment, the fibers stiffen and reciprocally twist to push the basal loop back up. Torrent Guasp equates this muscle response to the contractions of a cobra, whose muscle fibers also stiffen and rise when it lifts its head far above the ground. After nearly 50 years, Torrent Guasp's revolutionary and evolutionary concept of the heart was almost complete when a new nuclear imaging technique was employed to look at the contractions of the heart. Called a MugaScan, Isotopes along the heart are excited and change colors when the heart muscle contracts. With an understanding of the loops of the ventricular band, it is possible to follow the changing isotopes and visualize the wave of contraction that contradicts conventional knowledge. The recognized sequence is from apex to base, yet this method shows progression in an opposite direction, from base to apex. Here, the contraction begins with the initial activation of the outflow track of the right ventricle, as indicated by the two white spots, one at the root of the pulmonary artery and the other at the middle of the ventricular mass. Next, the white, red, and yellow area shows increased activation of the outflow track. The three white spots here show the right free wall beginning to contract. Muscle contraction of the right free wall increases and spreads to the free wall of the left ventricle. Now, both free walls of the ventricles, which make up the basal loop, are fully contracted. Next, the encircled region defines the area of the apical loop, which begins to contract after the basal loop has contracted. The white, red, yellow, clover-like area shows the septum beginning to contract. Soon, the whole encircled apical region develops contraction. The blue area indicates reduced contraction. And finally, the entire ventricular myocardium is in repose. 
Again, observe the wave of contraction as it moves across the band, just as Torrent Guasp had theorized. Many call it the cardiac dance, the twisting, pulsing rhythms of the human heart in motion. Now, for the first time in history, it can be understood as the sequential movement of the muscular band starting just below the pulmonary artery and ending where the band touches the aorta. The heart really is a tube, and, and the heart actually remains like a worm in a sense. That is, the impulse has to go from one point to the other. So if you start with the pulmonary artery on one side, and you go through this longitudinal tube that Dr. Tarant Guasp has shown us, you have to come out with the order on the other side. And once we saw that, we realized that, that we have to now explain it in terms of what we understand about how the heart works. The problem that first uh, arose when looking at uh, Tarrant Guasp's uh, concept of the band, uh, the heart being a band, is that uh, it, make, it would make sense that once it's unfolded, uh, as, as he unfolds the heart like this, it's clear that the first part of the heart's here at the pulmonary outflow tract, and then uh, the, it contracts around the, uh, uh, the apical portion, ventricular septal portion, and then the LV outflow tract. But that's not the way it's activated. In other words, this is not electrically stimulated first, and then the electrical impulse flows like this, which we, I think, which he thought at the beginning. The electrical impulse of the heart originates from specialized cells called the sinus node, located on the right atrium. The impulse spreads across the atria and causes them to contract. A conduction block between the atria and ventricles prevents the impulse from traveling directly across to the ventricles, except for one place in the AV node, located at the center of the heart. After a short delay, there is an explosion of electrical activity from the AV node down a specialized conduction system that saturates the inside of the ventricles with electrical activity. From that point on, the electrical activity goes from the inside of the heart to the outside of the heart by propagating through muscle cells. Examining electrophysiological and functional data, Dr. Cox and his group calculated the delivery of the impulse throughout the ventricular band. So if you very carefully plot out how the electrical impulse is delivered to the, to the heart muscle by the specialized conduction system and correlate that with the velocity of conduction in thin and thick areas of the heart, then it, then it comes out to precisely mimic the sequence of activation, uh, just as uh, you might have predicted or you might have hoped. Uh, and, you know, it, it has to be that way. I mean, we didn't make it that way. Uh, it, it, was, it, it has developed that way, and all we have to do is figure it out, and we just hadn't figured it out earlier. With the most important pieces of the puzzle solved, a model of the structure and mechanics of the torrent guasp myocardial ventricular band could now be constructed. The delivery of electrical impulses through the heart's specialized conduction system results in a wave of contractions that follows the path of the ventricular band from the pulmonary artery to the aorta. Active contraction wanes along the band as the wave progresses. Sequential activation of the model produces four phases of contraction that define narrowing, shortening, lengthening, and widening of the ventricles. When the basal loop contracts, it constricts or narrows the ventricles to compress the underlying muscle. The sequence starts with the right segment and then goes to the left segment to cause a clockwise cocking before beginning ventricular shortening. The contraction of the descending segment of the apical loop shortens the ventricle. The adherence of the apical loop to the rigid basal loop pulls the stiff outer shell down toward the apex. The fibrous connection of the great vessels descends with the basal loop. The spiral formation of the apical loop produces a twisting effect causing a counterclockwise rotation of the heart, including the apex, which remains in a fixed position. 
The shortening and twisting of the apical loop squeezes the ventricular cavity to raise pressure and opens the aortic valve to eject blood to the body. The helical course of the contraction continues with a vortex or figure eight around the apex. Contraction of the ascendant segment twists its fibers, resulting in a clockwise rotation of the heart. This clockwise twist of the apical loop produces a potential vacuum and begins to lengthen the ventricle, pushing the basal loop back up. The untwisting opens the AV valve so that atrial blood is actively sucked into the ventricle. This causes widening of the cavity as 50 to 60% of effective filling occurs as the ascending apical segment rises. Further widening occurs during relaxation of the entire muscular band. Full diastolic size follows atrial filling just before the next contraction begins. We've been taught in the past that the heart constricted and dilated, and we learned that from William Harvey, and it turns out that the spiral formation of the heart makes the heart twist and untwist. And when it twists and untwists, the twisting is for ejection, and the untwisting is for emptying. So once you understand that formation, you begin to understand what you see on, a, on an example of how the heart works. And in general, we have in the past looked at the cavity of the heart, but not the walls. And with the magnetic resonance imaging, we began to look at the walls. And suddenly you understand that the heart has an apex, which stays still. And the way it works is that it, it, it twists and thickens and untwists and lengthens. And so our concept of the heart filling and emptying by constriction and dilatation as a transverse segment factor doesn't, doesn't really occur in the heart. What I always learned in the past was that the heart filled from the atrium to the ventricle by the pressure that, that was different between the atrium and the ventricle. And this was taught to me over about 350 years because this is what William Harvey, who designed the circulation, taught us. And Well, if you look at the MRI, you see two things that are quite fascinating. First, you see it constrict and shorten and thicken to eject. And then you see it change its orientation and untwist, and it lengthens, and the cavity of the heart changes its size before the valves open. And because of that change in the size of the cavity compared to the blood within it, that is the blood's the same, you create suction. And with the suction, you can watch the blood on the MRI get sucked into the ventricle. And you can see that 90% of filling occurs during that initial phase, even though the pressure difference is tiny. It's not a pressure phenomenon, it's a suction phenomenon. So with understanding the, the nature of how the loops twist and untwist, you understand two things. The first thing you understand is how the heart ejects and fills by suction. And the second you thing you realize, if that anatomy is changed, as we can also see in MRI, where the ventricle becomes spherical, the capacity to twist and, su and, and eject and untwist and suck is lost. So the patient heart failure can't twist very well, and therefore he can't increase his output of his heart to be able to work, and he gets tired frequently. And more importantly, it can't untwist to suck the blood back. If it doesn't untwist to take the blood back, it only can fill by pressure. And that's exactly what Harvey said it did. But it only does that when it fails as a predominant mechanism. And when it fills by pressure, the pressure in the heart increases, the pressure in the lungs increase, and the patient has pulmonary congestion or his lungs get full of fluid and he can't breathe. And, and the, the symptoms are related to the inability of the heart to do its standard twisting and untwisting, which the spirals allow us to see. In, in studying uh, and comparing the, the structure and the, and the shape of healthy and sick hearts, we became aware of the fact that the sick heart represented a Romanesque structure. And in fact, uh, if we look at some structures that are typically Romanesque, such as the magnificent aqueduct of Segovia, which has stood since the year 10 uh, AD uh, and is absolutely perfect to this very day, we see that that has a very, very solid base because all the stones of the arch contribute equally and have forces that converge into the center, providing a very solid structure. But unfortunately, they cannot allow height or major width uh, 
which was provided rather brilliantly by the Gothic arts and the Gothic cathedral. And we see in Notre Dame, for instance, that remarkable, huge structure uh, with beautiful vaulted ceilings, which is sustained to this day by the very ingenious fact that all the vectors of force in that type of arch are transmitted outwardly so that you can put external supports in the way of flying buttresses that maintain a remarkably high and majestic structure. The very interesting thing is that the heart, the Gothic heart, then actually represents and can be understood very well by looking at Dr. Tarrant Grasp's normal heart model in the band. If we look at it, we see the very interesting image that in fact we have this Gothic structure supported on the outside by the basal loop. And that Gothic structure of fibers that spiral from out, outward to the inward portion provides the remarkable resilience and strength of that wall, as well as the ability to twist and squeeze out blood with extraordinary force and velocity, which are in fact the hallmarks of a healthy heart. When the heart becomes sick, however, the Gothic structure becomes Romanesque or rounded and loses its power to pump efficiently. The vectors of force no longer focus on the buttress, the basal loop, but balloon outward. The fiber orientation where the apical loop crosses changes from 60 degrees to something more horizontal, decreasing the heart's ability to twist and untwist effectively. As we look at the heart, as I understood it, the heart twists and it thickens. And this is a normal heart and it has an apex. And that apex is the normal function of the heart. It twists and thickens. In heart failure, it becomes a sphere, like a basketball. And it doesn't work well as a basketball. It can't do its normal activities. And so in a sense, a normal heart looks like a football. And you can, of course, throw a spiral pass. And you can get to the receiver. And the abnormal heart looks like a basketball. It, it's circular. And in a sense, uh, a high school quarterback can throw a pass 50 yards very well and in fact better than Magic Johnson can throw a basketball because the problem isn't the player, it's the, it's the ball you're dealing with. And so when you deal with heart failure, our purpose in heart failure is to simply make the basketball into a football. Several conditions result in a dilated heart. In surgical procedures now being performed by Dr. Buckberg and others, the left ventricle of a dilated heart is restored to its natural elliptical shape. Though different techniques are used, the goal for each is to bring the heart back to nature and restore the fiber orientation, the 60 degree angles, so the heart is capable of pumping and sucking more efficiently. These procedures provide a surgical solution that makes the spherical heart more elliptical and restores the helical heart formation. I believe that this, this concept of the normal anatomy of the heart and how normality is changed by pathology allows us to go back toward normality. And if that is correct, I think that the, the, the information that Dr. Tarrant Guasp has given us has allowed us to begin to deal with heart failure in a, in a purely geometric way that restores the natural formation, natural spiral formation. And, and I believe uh, we've been, so far we've been quite correct, and I think we're on track, and I think if we are on track, this information will help us deal with the biggest health hazard in the world, which is to heart failure. I think the importance of this uh, theory uh, and these findings in terms of research, uh, treatment, uh, and so on in the future is probably uh, not really known at the present time. It's, it's such a dramatic change from the understanding of the heart's uh, physiology, both electrophysiology and functional physiology, that we could almost go back and start repeating the experiments of the last 50 years now with this new knowledge in place and, and, and see how we interpret those, uh, some of those experiments now. The clear demonstration of the existence of this 
myocardial band and how it allows the structure of the heart to be configured in such a special way uh, undoubtedly will have a towering importance and would certainly be the equivalent but actually surpassed by far to the establishment of the circulatory system by Harvey. Uh, I say that without denying the historical importance of Harvey, but mostly because there has been a long period in which we did not have gigantic advances in understanding of the heart function, which could translate into major changes of the paradigms of treatment in surgery as well as in our medical treatment. And I think that this band is really going to fulfill that in addition to opening a number of important questions that should promote basic research of great significance. The Torrent Guasp Myocardial Ventricular Band, the heart unraveled, will change forever the way we view it. Such a simple thing like a rope, like a muscular band twisted like a rope that describes uh, a helicoid in this space, delimitating two cavities, the right ventricular cavity and the left ventricular cavity. This is so simple.